Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, I thank everyone for joining us for the webinar on recent advances in the role of S1 and GI malignancies. Uh, I would now invite Mr. Kishore from Torrent to please give the welcome. Over to you. Good evening. On behalf of Torrent, myself, Kishore Shetiga, extends a warm welcome to all for the International Speaker Program. In line with our mission to expand our access to quality drugs and provide information on disease management for the benefit of cancer patients, it gives us immense pleasure to take one more stride in this direction by arranging a virtual International Speaker Program on recent advances in S1 therapy for GI malignancies. It is a matter of pride to have amongst us eminent medical oncologist, Dr. Raghav Sundar from National University Cancer Institute, Singapore, as a speaker, and all our respected chairpersons and panelists from India, Dr. Purish Parikh, Dr. Shekhar Patil, Dr. Raghunatha Rao, Dr. Sham Agarwal, Dr. Satya Dattatraya, Dr. Babesh Parikh, Dr. Bishwajit, Dr. Sridhar Dasu, and Dr. Prabhat Bhagava as our key opinion leaders in this virtual international speaker program today. I thank everyone for being a part of this program and look forward to your opinions and suggestions that will help and guide us in finding clinical insights regarding all potential uses of ISFIN therapy. I now request the organizing chairperson, Dr. Purish Parikh, sir, to give a brief introduction of today's international speaker, Dr. Raghav Sundar, and then proceed over with this event. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Purish, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kishore. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Raghav Sundar, who is the consultant, Department of Hematology Oncology at the National University Cancer Institute, Singapore. He's also the assistant professor at Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore, and at, and at the Cancer and Stem Cell Biology Research, Duke NUS Medical School, N1, the, unit, the Institute for Health, National University of Singapore. And I now invite our speaker to please talk on the topic, recent advances in S1 for GI, GI malignancy. Over to you, sir. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm um, a GI oncologist practicing in Singapore and I understand from um, the, the committee that uh, S1 is newly coming into India for use uh, in the, in the re soon. So, um, today I'll share with you some of the indications and uses for S1 um, in gastrointestinal oncology. I'm going to share my slides. Um, are you able to see this? Yes, I have slide over with you. All right, great. Okay, let's get started. So these are my disclosures. Uh, and today we'll talk a little bit about uh, 5-FU pharmacology and then straight away dive into the role of S1 in uh, the different gastrointestinal tumor types. I, what is not going to be in the scope uh, of this discussion is, um, I, would, I will assume that everyone understands the, the landscape of the various cancers. And this is mainly putting into context the, the S1 related trials that are uh, being run in these different spaces rather than um, a big picture sort of thing. So um, let's talk a little bit about 5-FU uh, uh, biology first. So we know that 5-FU um, uh, is broken down by uh, DPD to DHFU. And DPD is actually um, widely present in the human body. Mostly it's in the liver, but it's also present in um, white blood cells, gastric intestinal mucosa, kidneys. Um, and this is kind of why 5-FU actually is a pretty good drug because it's so broadly available that you don't need to actually even have um, dose reductions for 5-FU when you give it in patients with liver impairment or with renal impairment. But one of the problems with the wide uh, availability of DPD is that when you originally try to give um, oral 5-FU, you, uh, it has very erratic uptake because it's very quickly broken down by the gastrointestinal mucosa. And that's kind of why uh, the oral 5-FUs that have been created have to be rationally designed to address some of this breakdown of 
if you into DPD. And then um, that's kind of why the oral 5-FU such as capecitabine and S1 come into play, where capecitabine is a, a rationally des designed prodrug of 5-FU that is broken down by several enzymatic um, uh, steps, three enzymatic steps essentially, with the last step being uh, uh, performed by this enzyme called EP or thymidine phosphorylase. And we know that thymidine phosphorylase is actually um, much higher expressed in tumor cells compared to cancer, uh, compared to normal cells. And that's kind of why uh, capecitabine then ends up going into the cancer cells more than uh, the normal cells. Um, similarly, uh, and uh, I'll move on to talking about to, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the drug of interest for today, which is essentially uh, 5-FE, uh, is, uh, is S1. And S1 is, is a combination of three drugs. Uh, it has Tegafa, which is um, a prodrug of 5-FU and is converted to 5-FU by uh, CYP2A6. It has Gimeracil, which is a DPD inhibitor, which is a, a, com a reversible competitive inhibitor of DPD. And uh, it has Oteracil, which inhibits the phosphorylation of 5-FU in the GI tract. And essentially, the three drugs put together where Tegafa is metabolized into 5-FU, uh, Gimeracil inhibits DPD and reduces the um, uh, uh, degradation of 5-FU and therefore uh, is supposed to help in reduction of uh, the incidence of hand foot syndrome as well as neurotoxicity. Um, on the other side, you also have Oteracil, which is um, essentially uh, reduces the GI toxicity by uh, uh, reducing the phosphorylation of uh, 5-FU in the, in the GI system. And S1 is essentially a combination of these three drugs in this 0 0.4, 1 is to 1 ratio. And um, for those of you who are, who are uh, yet to be familiar with S1, essentially comes as a capsule. It's actually uh, slightly smaller than the 500 milligram capecitabine tablets. And um, okay, so uh, moving on from pharmacology into the different tumor types, I think um, as a gastrointestinal oncologist, I predominantly use S1 in gastric cancer because I think most of the evidence, the strongest evidence for the use of S1 um, compared to capecitabine, for example, lies in gastric cancer. So I'm going to cover gastric cancer in a little bit more depth, uh, followed by hepatobiliary cancers and then followed by um, uh, colorectal cancer. So first we'll talk about locally advanced gastric cancer. And uh, these are the, the, the key studies that we will cover which includes the, in the adjuvant setting, the AX-GC study, the JACRO-GC07 Jack study, as well as ARTIS-2. And in the new adjuvant setting, uh, there's the JCOG-0501, but more importantly is the PRODIGY and the RESOLVE study. So I'm gonna talk about these in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the AX-GC study is uh, an adjuvant study that was um, first, uh, it's, it's a Japanese study that essentially looks at uh, patients with um, stage two and stage three gastric cancer that were randomized after surgery to each one year of S1 or observation. Uh, again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with S1 uh, dosing, it's essentially given similar to capecitabine uh, as a BD dosing. And um, the typical regimen for S1 is uh, four weeks on, or rather the standard S regimen for S1 is a four weeks on, two weeks off regimen, but very often due to cumulative toxicities, um, it can be switched over to a two week on, one week off regimen. Again, very similar to capecitabine. And so uh, in this study, uh, S1 uh, demonstrated an overall survival benefit compared to uh, uh, observation alone with a 10% improvement in overall survival with a uh, 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 and a 12% improvement in relapse free survival. And this essentially established S1 as a standard of care of. Um, for adjuvant treatment in, in Japan for the longest of time. Um, this was recently supplanted by the JACRO GC07 study, which focused specifically on stage three node positive gastric cancers, where patients were randomized in one is one fashion to the uh, now standard of care, I mean, the recent standard of care of S1 with um, an addition of six cycles of uh, docetaxel 2 S1. And this was a large study with 1,100 patients that were randomized. And there was improvement in relapse-free survival uh, to, to the addition of um, 
docetaxel 2 S1 uh, with an improvement of survival of about 15%. And uh, this was recently updated in uh, ASCO GI last year with also a, def a, a definitive improvement in overall survival with a three-year OS with the docetaxel S1 arm uh, reaching 77% compared to 71%, so a 6% improvement in OS. Uh, for the addition of docetaxel. And this has now essentially become the standard of care in Japan, where most patients with known positive or stage three gastric cancer receive um, one year of S1 with uh, six cycles of docetaxel. Uh, I mean, six cycles of docetaxel in combination with S1 with a follow up of S1 for one year. Um, I'm going to talk about ARTIS-2, but to bring you up to speed to ARTIS-2, I'm going to talk about ARTIS-1 first. So, ARTIS-1 actually looked at the role of uh, the addition of concurrent chemo radiation in that juvenile setting, where patients who had un it's a Korean study where patients had undergone a D2 resection were randomized in a one to one fashion to uh, capecitabine and cisplatin for two cycles, followed by concurrent chemo radiation with capecitabine, and then it's a sandwich regimen with another two cycles of cap cis uh, compared to six cycles of just cis uh, cap alone, which is a surrogate for. The, 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 the Zelox regimen, which was established as standard of care for classic. And essentially in artist 2 there was no difference in the addition of chemo radiation for uh, the patients compared to XP alone. However, in a subgroup analysis, it was found that um, the node positive patients may have benefited from the addition of uh, concurrent chemo radiation. And so that's what uh, brought the artist 2 regimen along. And by then S1 was starting to take precedence in um, Asia, and therefore they replaced, they, they redesigned the uh, ARTIS-2 study looking at node positive gastro, gastric cancer. And this was a larger study with 900 patients that had three arms, where they compared um, uh, the same sandwich regimen, but this time using SOX instead of uh, XP, uh, compared to uh, six months of SOX, which is um, essentially uh, the, the surrogate for the six months of Zlox from the classic study with the the AXGC uh, um, and um, what was very clear was that both the socks in the orange line, as well as the uh, uh, sandwich uh, 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 chemo RT regimen was actually superior to one uh, to single agent S1 alone. But what was also quite clear was that the addition of radiation didn't seem to have any benefit. So this now has established socks as uh, an alternative to Zlox. Uh, in the adjuvant setting for gastric cancer based on this regimen. So generally speaking, for patients with uh, uh, who have a resection, upfront resection of gastric cancer uh, for, and then require adjuvant treatment, if they are node positive, we will recommend either SOX or Zlox. And if they're node negative, then one could consider S1 alone. But uh, potentially, if these patients are fit, it is, it is reasonable to offer these patients um, a doublet regimen as well. Um, yeah, so so essentially, uh, ARTIS-2 was a positive study where SOX was um, superior to S1 uh, in the node positive gastric cancer patients. And just placing all these studies side by side for you to take a look, essentially, we have AXGC, we have Classic, we have JAPRO GC07 and ARTIS-2. And um, essentially, if you can see that there's a KPOX here, there's a JACRO GC07, uh, S1 docetaxel, and there's SOX, and all these three. Um, do keep in mind that JACRO GC07, although has a slightly uh, lower DFS, freer DFS compared to the others, this actually included a slightly higher risk of population compared to AXGC Classic and Artist 2 that also included a few stage 2 gastric cancers that were uh, at node positive, at least in ARTIS-2, but uh, there were no negative patients that involved in AXGC and Classic, and that's kind of why the RFS is slightly lower here. But as of today, uh, acceptable standards of care and adjuvant treatment in gastric cancer include S1 alone for one year, KPOX or Zlox for six months, S1 docetaxel, as well as SOX. Okay, uh, moving on to S1 in the perioperative setting, which we know um, is a European standard of care that has been established by FLOT. Um, and essentially, this is a Korean study, the pro, uh, sorry, this is the Prodigy study, which essentially looked at locally advanced gastric cancers that were randomized in a one is to one fashion with DOS, which is the oral alternative to FLOT with docetaxel, oxaliplatin, and S1 for three cycles. 
followed by a D2 resection, followed by another eight cycles of S1 alone, compared to just uh, one year of S1 alone. So do keep in mind that uh, eight cycles of S1 is actually one year of S1 uh, in the six weeks sort of regimen of four weeks on, two weeks off. So actually the, the, the interventional arm actually got more chemotherapy compared to the, the standard arm where a fairer comparison would have been actually to throw this DOS or something like uh, uh, docetaxel S1 in the adjuvant setting to compare. But that being said, um, the, the DOS regimen is a little bit more convenient compared to FLOT where you need to put in a protocap to give infusional 5-FU. And this regimen did demonstrate a, a progression-free survival benefit uh, of around 6% uh, at the three-year mark compared to uh, the adjuvant uh, uh, surgery followed by chemotherapy arm alone. And this was published uh, in uh, this was published in the JCO last year. Um, let's move on to the resolve study that was a very large Chinese study uh, performed uh, in um, very very locally advanced gastric cancer. So only T4A node positive or T4B node um, equivocal uh, disease, where a thousand patients were randomized into three arms, and this was a fairer comparison where patients either got three cycles of SOX followed by a D2 resection, followed by another five cycles of SOX, uh, compared to just surgery followed by six, uh, six months of SOX alone. And they compared this with the classic regimen of six months of Zelox. And in this, uh, the, the classic regimen of Zelox was uh, considered the standard of care arm. And these were the comparator arms. And essentially both the comparator arms, SOX, uh, the, the perioperative SOX as well as the adjuvant SOX, um, okay, so the perioperative SOX did better than Zelox. The adjuvant SOX uh, looks like it's slightly better than the Zelox arm, but it actually didn't reach statistical sig significance. And so essentially this established uh, the use of SOX in the perioperative setting, although one might argue on whether there's a difference between FLOT and SOX and that sort of thing. And essentially if a patient can take triplet therapy, one would recommend uh, patients to go for FLOT. Uh, if the patients don't want a porter cat, then it is potentially acceptable to use DOS. I have used DOS in the past. It is a little bit more toxic than FLOT uh, because of the oral uh, component of the 5-FU. And uh, if patients are not fit for doublets, then uh, triplets, then uh, it is reasonable to give the patient Zelox or uh, SOX. This was one of the few studies that also compared head-to-head adjuvant uh, Zelox and adjuvant SOX. So I put the toxicities for you side by side here. And you can see that actually there isn't much differences in the toxicities when it comes to things like um, neutropenia as well as uh, leukopenia. But it did appear that um, the SOX regimen had slightly higher thrombocytopenia rates compared to, to Zelox. Although I think the P less than 001 is for the perioperative SOX where it went up to about uh, 31%. Uh, but for the rest of the things, especially for, um, I'm surprised they didn't put Hanfoot syndrome here, but apart from Hanfoot syndrome, it looks like the other things like um, uh, uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, neuropathy, diarrhea rates are actually quite similar between the two arms. All right. Um, again, for ease of comparison, I've actually put all the different trials here together, um, but I'm... In the interest of time, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this and we'll leave this for the discussion stage. Um, in terms of uh, guideline recommendations, so the ESMO guidelines actually says that um, S1 monotherapy is uh, an acceptable standard of care for patients uh, based on the AXGC study. Japanese guidelines, of course, have both S1 as well as SOCT as recommendations. Uh, moving on to S1 in the metastatic gastric cancer setting. So actually these were the older trials for, that were first performed to bring S1 into play in Japan. And the key studies that we'll talk about is the JCOG 9912, Spirits and Flags, uh, non-inferiority study about GSOX as well. Um, so this was one of the first studies that brought S1 into play. It was randomized. Uh, the, the JCOG 9912 was a three-arm study comparing infusional 5-FU to S1 to cisplatin ironotecan looking at the non-inferiority of S1 to 5-FU, as well as the cis, uh, uh, superiority of cis ironotecan to infusional 5-FU. And what this study showed was that S1 was indeed non-inferior to 5-FU, uh, perhaps a little bit better, 
uh, while uh, cis aeronautican did not achieve superiority and this essentially established s1 as a standard of care in japan in the metastatic uh, gastric cancer setting as a single agent then we move on to the uh, the spirit study where patients with metastatic first line gc were randomized in one s1 fashion to the addition of cis platin to s1 to give a doublet 5 fu platinum regimen compared to s1 alone and in this study um, uh, the the doublet regimen did have an uh, DFS as well as OS benefit, so this establishes S1 as the standard of care in the metastatic setting for Japan, and for the longest of time, in, even up to today, it is still used as the first line treatment in uh, gastric cancer. Um, the the Japanese tried to bring this to the US for registration, and they ran the spirit. Uh, sorry, this is the flag study where they they brought they compared cis s1 to cis 5 fu but they had different doses of the cis platin for the cis 5 fu and the cis s1 arms and um, this essentially was unable to show a superiority for cis s1 compared to cis 5 fu uh, although there was a lower um, uh, there was lower side effects in the cis 5 fu arm uh, cis s1 arm although we are not sure if this is because of the lower dose of cis platin because 100 mg of 100 mg per meter square of cis platin is actually quite a big dose for metastatic gastric cancer. Um, the GSOX study was uh, 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 looked at the non inferiority of SOX compared to cis S1, and this essentially demonstrated the non inferiority of SOX. And we know that oxaliplatin is easier to administer compared to cis platin, and this therefore has established SOX as an alternative option for uh, patients with metastatic gastric cancer. Um, of course, in the immunotherapy era, uh, I do have to draw your attention to attraction four, which randomized patients with either Zilox or SOX to, uh, um, uh, with the addition of nivolumab, where 60% of patients in this trial actually received the SOX regimen. And of course, we know that the addition of nivolumab achieved an overall survival benefit uh, with the addition of chemotherapy with a progression-free survival of 10 months, which was... Uh, achieved the primary endpoint of superiority, but it was unable to achieve uh, uh, an overall survival benefit, but do keep in mind that it had a whopping 17.5 months uh, so overall survival, which is the highest um, overall survival that we have achieved in gastric cancer and a non-biomarker selected uh, population, which is nearly one and a half years. Uh, and in the international guidelines, we have um, essentially uh, ESMO recommending S1 as single agent. The Pan-Asian guidelines suggest that S1 can be used as a platinum 5-FU doublet. And um, all right, let's move on to S1 in pancreatic cancer. There are three trials that I'd like to talk about. One is the JESS study that looked at a comparison of S1 with gemcitabine. Uh, the JASPAC in metastatic gastric cancer, the JASPAC study that looked at uh, S1 versus gem um, and uh, the uh, neoadjuvant uh, pre-op uh, O2 study. So the JESS study was a three-arm study in metastatic pancreatic, uh, sorry, locally advanced or metastatic pancreatic cancer, randomized 800 patients to gemcitabine S1 or gem S1. And in this study, uh, uh, S1 was non-inferior to gem and uh, gem S1 was superior to gem, although in the context of gemabraxane, one's not really very sure whether GEMS1 will be, will be better than gemabraxane. Um, there was an improvement in progression-free survival as well uh, for the GEMS1 arm. Um, all right, moving on to uh, adjuvant uh, treatment. Here we have patients with resected pancreatic cancer who were randomized to GEM versus S1 alone. And uh, there was a clear survival benefit for S1 compared to GEM alone. And therefore, uh, this established adjuvant S1 as an option for patients in metastatic pancreatic cancer as well. So essentially, where does S1 sit in pancreatic cancer? So I feel that in the context of um, uh, adjuvant treatment with patients who are fit, do remember that there is the SPAC4 that has GEM CAPE, there is the PRODIG that has Folferinox, as well as um, uh, JASPAC study that is S1. So depending on fitness of patients, essentially you can offer patients one drug, two drugs, or three drugs. And in the metastatic setting, it is reasonable to offer gemcitabine alone uh, for unfit patients, but potentially those who don't want to have injection treatments, S1 is, is an option that can be considered. All right, moving on to biliary tract cancers. Uh, there are three trials that I'd like to draw your attention to. 
first is the FUBA BP study, then is the Mitsuba study, both in advanced biliary tract cancers. And then recently just presented at ASCO GI a couple of months ago uh, is the ASCOT study in adjuvant biliary tract cancers. So the FUGA BT study looked at comparing the, the ABC gem cis compared to gem S1 alone. And essentially there was no difference between the two arms and therefore presented this as a potential option. Although I don't see a lot of benefits in using this compared to cis gem alone, which is a very well tolerated regimen. But this then brought, brought on the, 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 the addition of um, S1 2 cis gem in the Mitsuba study which was also presented in the same year in ESMO. And in this study, there was actually a, a modest improvement in overall survival uh, for the addition of the S1 in the triplet regimen with a one month improvement in OS, but you can look at it, the curves are actually quite close to each other, but there was a reasonable uh, improvement in progression-free survival of around two and a half months, uh, I mean, uh, around two months for the triplet regimen. So essentially one, could consider this as a, an option for patients if you do want uh, an improved response in your super fit uh, advanced biliary tract cancer patients. Although do keep in mind that the cisgem abraxin option or napaclitaxin option is also a reasonable option to consider in these patients. Um, the ASCOT study is uh, in biliary tract cancers uh, is essentially um, replicating the BILCAP study where patients who had surgery alone uh, I mean, uh, surgery for uh, resectable biliary tract cancers are randomized to surgery alone compared to adjuvant S1 for um, uh, six months. And essentially, this was presented as an overall survival benefit of around 10% in the ad, uh, adjuvant S1 compared to surgery alone. And if one remembers, the BILCAP study actually in the original intention to treat population did not meet its primary endpoint as overall survival while this ASCOT study actually met its primary endpoint of overall survival. And therefore one can say that um, it is very reasonable to offer patients adjuvant S1 based on the ASCOT study uh, for uh, biliary tract cancers based on these data. Um, all right, last is S1 in metastatic colorectal cancer. And essentially um, there are a whole bunch of studies in this setting where there was a non-inferiority of SOX compared to Zlox. Um, non-inferiority of SOX-BEV compared to FOLFOX-BEV, which was also proven, uh, non-inferiority of S1 in combination with Ironotican and BEV compared to FOLFOX-BEV or KPOX-BEV in the tricolor study, which was also demonstrated as non-inferior. This SALTO study was um, a very interesting study where they looked at hand foot syndrome rates in patients in uh, metastatic colorectal cancer who were not fit for triplet therapy or combination treatment, S1 and CAPE alone. And actually the hand foot syndrome rates were lower in the S1 compared to CAPE cytopene. And then looking at um, S1 BEV in elderly patients uh, in the second line setting, the non-inferiority of S1 ironotecan compared to Paul TV and uh, SOX compared to um, uh, uh, single agent 5-FU in the adjuvant colorectal cancer setting. However, considering the very, very well-established 5-FU and KPOX regimens, for FOX KPOX regimens in colorectal cancer, I'll be honest with you, I hardly use S1 in metastatic colorectal cancer. That being said, uh, there are some guidelines that suggest that um, the ESMO guidelines do suggest that one could consider using SOX or uh, CIRI uh, based on the tricolor regime, uh, uh, the trial. And um, uh, just in January 2020, uh, in January 2022, as EMA actually approved S1 for metastatic colorectal cancer for treatment of patients who it is not possible to treat with another 5-FU because of hand foot syndrome or cardio cardiovascular tox, um, based largely on uh, SALTO and tricolor. Um, and of course, the Japanese, considering that this is a Japanese drug, have actually approved it, have approved SOXBEV, CVBEV, as well as S1BEV in metastatic colorectal cancer. And with that, that's a whirlwind tour of S1 in GI cancers. And with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Agav. That was indeed a wonderful exposition and a very nice uh, detailed overview of all the possible uh, indications for S1. And it's very nice to know that there are indications beyond gastric and colorectal cancer, which have shown significant benefit. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions 
but uh, i think uh, we'll uh, see if there is anything specific so dr shalin kumar has said what are the similarities and differences with cape city uh, rakav if you can uh, unmute yourself sorry uh sorry yes, just give me a sec um okay so um good question so i think uh we should divide this into um areas in which uh there are clear indications for s1 and there are no clear indications for cape cytobin alone uh which i think will be the clear cut spaces to begin with right so for example if you are talking about um single agent s1 in adjuvant gastric cancer there is no indication for single agent cape cytobin as, as of this point of time based on randomized phase 3 study so if you want to offer a patient uh, a single agent in an in locally advanced gastric cancer again this i don't think we have the that i mean we can go into it but whether you want to choose a singlet or doublet to treat adjuvant gastric cancer is a separate discussion but if you have already chosen a singlet to treat these patients then uh, s1 would be the evidence based uh, drug of choice um the other place i think is rapidly emerging is in pancreatic cancer where for example if the patient is uh, has metastatic pancreatic cancer and has uh, wants a sing, uh, singlet treatment and doesn't want injections then i think is reasonable to offer s1 based on the jet study there is no role for giving capecitabine in metastatic pancreatic cancer as a single agent uh similarly in adjuvant pancreatic cancer again if patients don't want a uh, doublet or triplet treatment and they want single agent they don't want injections again s1 has evidence but capecitabine doesn't have evidence um adjuvant biliary tract cancer will be the other space based on ascot although i think it hasn't entered guidelines yet but the data are pretty, pretty convincing and here i will say that given that bilcap has been standard of care and we've been giving adjuvant capecitabine for patients i would say that it can be offered as an alternative and has potentially now stronger evidence compared to bilcap where bilcap at least technically didn't reach uh, its primary endpoint of overall survival although the long term survival data that was just presented uh, published in jco i think last week actually is pretty convincing that capecitabine is a reasonable standard of care i think the other place that um, now if you talk start talking about uh, places where both s1 or capecitabine can be used and can be used interchangeably then the other strong place where at least based on salto and those sort of trials is where if the patient um has a high rate of hand foot syndrome from capecitabine one could consider switching to s1 but to be very honest with you person from personal use of both s1 and capecitabine i don't see a massive decrease in the hand foot syndrome i i won't say that s1 has no hand foot syndrome it rates it actually has a pretty reasonable amount of hand foot syndrome um and lastly i think it's cost and at least in singapore s1 is still more expensive than capecitabine so as far as it comes to me from a practical basis i just give capecitabine if i can unless there are clear, indi clear indications to give s1 right dr biswajit uh, our senior medical oncology colleague has asked a very important question is, is there any data to compare 6 weeks s1 versus 3 weeks s1 a good question so as far as i know there are no three randomized phase 3 studies comparing this but from a practical basis if you're given if you've given s1 in the four uh, four four weeks on two weeks on regimen it's super difficult to give it by the third or fourth week patients already coming in with their hands peeling and diarrhea and stuff like that so i have had a very very small handful of patients who have survived the full one year of four weeks on two weeks off and almost halfway through i'll always switch them to a two weeks on one week off so right, it's a practical right. answer it's very very hard to to stick to the four weeks on two weeks on for one full year right. thank you very much dr raghav sundar it was wonderful to listen to you and we hope to involve you in the future as well on behalf of our organization as well as on behalf of sponsors i thank you very much and now we move on to the very important panel discussion whose moderator is none other than my dear friend dr shyam agarwal who is senior medical oncologist and director of oncology at sir gangara hospital in new delhi uh i if i continue saying everything i know about sham i will take away the his entire panel discussion time so i will refrain from doing that and i hand over to dr sham 
The panelists are Dr. Prabhat Bhargava, medical oncologist from Tata Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Biswajit Jubashi, medical oncologist from Puducherry. Dr. Raghunath Rao Digumarthi from Vizak. Dr. Bhavesh Parekh, medical oncologist from Ahmedabad. Dr. Shekhar Patil, a very senior medical oncologist from Bangalore. And Dr. Siddhar Dasu, Sridhar Dasu, uh, who is the senior oncologist on the panel from Hyderabad. Over to you, Shyam. Thanks, uh, Purvish, uh, for those kind words. And uh, I think Dr. Raghav uh, will stay back for the panel. Uh, or I, 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 Dr. Raghav, will you be able to you know, continue with us through the discussion? Uh, I mean, if you want me to stay on, I'm happy to stay on. I'm just I'm going up. It's 11 p.m. in Singapore right now. So it might be difficult for him. But if he's uh, there for a few minutes, it's our honor and pleasure. I'll, I'll stay on for a while. I'm okay with that. The kids are asleep. So Thank, okay. you. Thank you very much. So, you know, I mean, uh, this drug is absolutely new for us uh, since it's just being launched. So I, you know, uh, kind of uh, drafted this panel discussion, um, looking at whatever information we could gather. I, I think we, we didn't, at least I didn't have all the information which you have shared with us. I mean, that's really uh, very encouraging in terms of pancreatic and biliary cancers. So I think, uh, so my questions are rather basic, but we can skip some of those questions. And I, I do see a lot of these questions in the, in the uh, you know, a chat box. So which I think uh, the panelists and uh, certainly I'll request Dr. Raghav to help resolve them. So, um, you know, my, my first question was, we have another, you know, fluoropyrimidine. Um, so the, the, the question to uh, say Dr. Shekhar Patil, so do we really need, uh, where is the need for fluoropyrimidines in oncology? You know, I think some of the things I've highlighted here, uh, Shekhar, you, 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 what are your thoughts on fluoropyrimidines and malignancies? Is Shekhar there? Uh, Shekhar, so can I request you to unmute your mic? Or maybe uh, Prabhat can take it if Prabhat is there. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, yes. fluoropyrimidines are very important drug in all most of the malignancies, and we have hardly able uh, been able to remove them in breast cancer. It is upcoming again uh, as adjuvant capstabin has a role in TNBCs and other, even S1 has a role in even hormone positive breast cancers. GI malignancies backbone is FIFU, so obviously we need some modifications of IFU to continue treatment uh, of our patients. And right, biliary so, cancers, as he showed, uh, Dr. Raghav showed us. Correct. So, you know, I, th I think the basics have already been said. So I'll uh, request Dr. Raghav to right away tell us, I mean, we spoke about only stomach and uh, colon and pancreatic biliary. So the question is, as Prabhat is also pointing out, is there data for S1 in other malignancies where 5-FU has been used successfully, like I've written here, breast cancer and head and neck cancer? I am sorry, but I, I'm actually a GI oncologist and I'm quite subspecialized in GI, so I am not going to be in a position to, to, talk, to comment, okay. uh, at least okay. on the latest data on breast and head and neck. But what I can say is that um, from, a, from a, I mean, I, I am on the advisory board for Taiho and uh, essentially, for S1, they have it is a very much um, Japanese-driven sort of uh, drug development okay. pipeline. It's a very Japanese-driven drug drug development pipeline, and essentially, the Western countries don't believe in the S1 data because all the trials that are run in Japan show that the data looks beautiful. Like JASPAC, if you look at if you compare the S1 and gemcitabine single agent trials in pancreatic cancer, and like wow, how can a single agent five of you work so much better than single agent gem, right? So and Every time it's replicated in the Western countries, it um, it isn't replicated as well. So if you look at, for example, I mean, one of the common studies that people cite to say that the Japanese response to S1 is always much better than the rest of the world is like, for example, the flag study where they compared uh, CIS-5-FU versus um, CIS-S1 and they, in the Western countries and they couldn't replicate this. But I actually think that there is a strong element of pharmacogenomics that comes back to this. And this uh, being in Singapore, which is a multicultural country where we have 70% um, of the population being Chinese and 30% uh, of the 20% of the population being Malay, 
uh, which is the local indigenous population of Southeast Asia and 10% of the population being Indian, that um, the tolerance for oral 5-FU is actually very different between the different uh, racial groups. So the Chinese tolerate capecitabine and S1 a lot better compared to the, the, the Indians and the Malays. And this actually goes back to the Indians actually having very similar pharmacogenomics to the Caucasian population. So the rates of hand foot syndrome, diarrhea and all that with capecitabine and therefore also with S1 is actually much higher in these populations compared to um, uh, the, 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 the Asian population essentially. And therefore, if you're, if you're using uh, the S1 data in, in India, I would strongly urge you to actually compare the, the, the toxicity rates to capecitabine. It will not be extremely different from capecitabine toxicity rates uh, and will actually be fairly different from the, the, the Japanese toxicity rates. So this, this question of does the role of uh, additional 5FUs come into play, the answer is actually, is I think we have to go back to the evidence that are being generated when we use these drugs and you can't just switch all your patients who are on capecitabine to S1 sort of thing. Um, Absolutely. It's the broad principle advice that I can give here. So, Right. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Raghu, uh, Raghunada Rao, uh, I think you're there. Thank you very much, Shyam. Go ahead. So I think uh, Dr. Raghav has raised uh, several pertinent points uh, regarding pharmacogenomics, uh, regarding the toxicity, and uh, I put in here, for example, uh, breast cancer, as Prabhat was saying, and there is a question in the chat box on uh, data in rectal cancer. So, you know, I mean, whatever information <clears throat> or your, your thoughts are uh, on S1, on these aspects, I'll be, we'll be very happy to hear from you. Yeah, you have to unmute, uh, Raghu, you have to unmute yourself. People claim that it has less GI toxicity, less uh, neuropathy, less hand foot syndrome, and less cardiac toxicity as well. Um, but I, if that is pharmacogenetically determined, then uh, uh, probably, as uh, Dr. Raghav has said, the Indians will be as prone to hand foot syndrome from S1 uh, as they are from uh, capecitabine or 5 fluorouracil. So it may not be uh, much different. Uh, but having said that, if you see the use of uh, 5-FU induced toxicity, uh, it's pretty different whether you give it in the uh, chronic uh, form or in the acute form. So that is very well known. Uh, it's nothing uh, uh, dramatic about it. Uh, so the breast cancer patient has a different 5-FU toxicity than the uh, GI patient. And that is where probably S1 might actually score. So right. my feeling is that it is good to give it uh, uh, in those situations where we were very comfortable giving it as uh, uh, monotherapy or in combination with oxaliplatinum should not be a problem. So you could possibly replace 5 fluorouracil in all those situations. I'm a little wary of using 5 fluorouracil in head and neck, uh, especially yeah. in those who have had a, a radiation prior to uh, they may actually precipitate a radiation recall phenomenon and severe mucositis, uh, which typically uh, carries away the patient. Okay. Thank you, Raghu. So there's a question, Dr. Raghav, uh, regarding rectal cancer. So is there data to support uh, for capecitabine? Uh, I mean, of course, capecitabine is used uh, along with, say, radiation or in K-pox, et cetera. So uh, is S1 effective and data is there in rectal cancer as well? Yeah, so so as far as I'm, I'm aware, there are no major large trials looking at S1 in combination with radiation. So I'll be quite careful of using it as, uh, using S1 with concurrent chemo radiation compared to capecitabine where we are actually very familiar with using capecitabine in the chemo radiation sort of setting. I would like to highlight though that when we're talking about 5FU here that the, the use of infusional 5-FU and oral 5-FU actually have quite a lot of differences in toxicity. So, for example, hand foot syndrome is quite uh, uh, a lot Less. more in oral 5-FU compared to infusional 5-FU. Right. So, if your patient is having hand foot syndrome from or a uh, capecitabine, for example, I would strongly urge you to not consider switching to S1, but rather advise the patient to switch to Fox or I mean, infusional 5-FU uh, or Degramont or something like that, rather than offering the patient to switch from capecitabine to S1. 
So, uh, Dr. Bhavesh did ask a uh, role of S1 with radiation in rectal cancer. So, there is very little, as you said. So, when Dr. Raghu was saying that, uh, I mean, let me ask this question. You know, if somebody is on uh, tape cytobine and the patient has hand foot syndrome, uh, is not tolerating the drug, you know, I mean, tape cytobine. So, is it wise to switch to uh, S1 or you think uh, go to the other drug? Dr. Raghav? Yeah, so in my practice, if the patients have hand foot syndrome from Cape Cytobine, we will just go through the standard principles of just stopping the drug, letting the patient improve, supportive treatments, emollients, and um, good nursing care. And then depending on the need to continue with the 5-FU drug, we will advise the patient to actually switch to infusion of 5-FU rather than switching from Cape Cytobine to S1. In a very, very small subgroup of patients who um, are absolutely refusing to take inf injection-based drugs, especially because infusion 5, if you requires a podocath or a PICC line right. or something like that, then in that small subgroup of patients, I will discuss switching. But to be honest, switching versus just dose reducing the capecitabine and re-challenging is probably not much different. And at least in Singapore, the cost of capecitabine is a lot lower than S1. So there's very little reason for me to switch patients from CAP to S1. Right. Bhavesh, you want to ask a question directly uh, to uh, to Dr. Raghav? Dr. Bhavesh, you are, you know, on the chat box, you are active. Dr. Yes. Bhavesh? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Raghav, uh, if at all some, uh, some hand foot syndrome because of S1, is the same principle we should use to treat hand foot syndrome because of S1 or any other difference uh, compared to capacity? Pretty much. So our hand foot syndrome uh, pathways that we have in our hospital are very similar for S1 and uh, capecitabine in terms of um, uh, stopping the drug, supportive care, and then restart at a dose reduction. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, there's another question on HCC. Have, have you tried in uh, hepatocellular or, uh, you know, I mean, you should not be venturing into that without any data. I mean... Not in the immunotherapy era, you should not be giving chemotherapy to HCC patients. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have Dr. Sridhar Dasu, who is the surgical oncologist. And you, you know, you showed us data on uh, perioperative, uh, you know, uh, chemo uh, with the docetaxel uh, flot versus DOS. So, Dr. Da Dr. Uh, uh, Sridhar, you want to ask any question? Uh, there uh, regarding the use of, uh, you know, pre-operative or perioperative uh, chemo, Dr. Dasu? Uh, yes, sir. Because this is a common question. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm the only surgical oncologist in a panel full of medical oncologists. Yes. Yes. But uh, yes. uh, the basic funda we used to always have, sometimes you have patients, you know, who undergo upfront surgery and then you know, they go for adjuvant chemotherapy. And our medical oncologists always say that it's better, you know, the patient should have gone for some form of perioperative chemotherapy, especially... Uh, if the CT shows, uh, you know, not positive disease or some mild perigastric fat stranding. And uh, my argument was always that there is no head-on comparison between perioperative chemotherapy followed by surgery versus surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. So I wanted to ask, sir, like, is, is I mean, in Singapore also, uh, if you have a CT finding which shows that, uh, especially for distal stomach cancers, uh, adenocarcinomas, and do they generally uh, go for a perioperative chemotherapy or is there... Uh, is it like um, uh, a surgeon dependent uh, thing where you can, if the surgeon feels that the nodes can be uh, resected, then they go for surgery and wait for the final staging to plan uh, adjuvant chemotherapy? Thanks. Great question. And we usually have a, a one hour lecture just on this in most of our conferences. Yeah. And uh, Singapore takes, Singapore takes a, a very pragmatic stance here where we, we take a little bit of the West and a little bit of the East when we make decision making. Like I know in, in Europe, everyone will go for flot. If you're T2 and not and above, you'll go for flot before you go for surgery. And in Japan, unless you the, the, the tumor is stuck to everything, the spleen, pancreas, everything, they'll go for surgery first and then only go for uh, uh, chemotherapy after that. But in Singapore, what we do is that we will discuss most patients in a multidisciplinary tumor board. Uh, almost every patient who is T3 and above or node positive will get a diagnostic laparoscopy to ensure that patients don't have peritoneal metastases. Um, sorry, my screen froze out. Am I clear? Yeah, we are hearing you. We can hear you properly. Go on. 
So, so, so everyone will get a diagnostic laparoscopy to rule out peritoneal metastases and then be discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board to decide on whether the patient should get perioperative treatment followed by surgery or they should get surgery up front. But there are a few considerations that we'll take into account. Number one is the location of the tumor. Is this gastroesophageal junction or is this uh, pile can uh, that I mean, how much of the esophagus will need to come out, and uh, is is this uh, pylorus in, involving? And do you can we save the patient from a total gas tract or not? Because these, if you can save the patient from a total gas tract, or if you can avoid doing an esophagectomy, and you can actually give the patients um, uh, perioperative chemotherapy to bring the, the size of the tumor down, then we will advise the patients to go for perioperative chemo, considering that this is not like, for example, a tea tree and not tumor sort of thing. The other consideration is whether the tumor is bleeding or not. Because if the tumor is bleeding, it's actually going to be pretty difficult for you to give um, chemotherapy. And we generally prefer not to give like palliative radio before the surgeons go in. So if the tumor is bleeding and the surgeons can take it out, they can actually be sure of getting R not resections. We'll actually ask the surgeons to take it out first. Um, of course, in a setting like mine where we are, we, we are an academic hospital with multiple clinical trials and we are actually very heavily involved in gastric cancer research, we do have a lot of uh, perioperative uh, trials, especially with immunotherapy and things like that. So if patients are candidates for clinical trials, then we will encourage them to enroll into these clinical trials, especially if they get exposure to immunotherapy in that sort of setting. So it is a very case-by-case -case sort of question uh, uh, scenario, and we would not push yeah. for uh, one option over another is the answer to this your question. So since we are on S1, uh, Dr. Raghav, you, you showed us the data on uh, DOS. And, you know, I mean... Uh, uh, FLOT requires uh, 24 hours infusion each time. So, you know, I mean, if you look at um, our country or anywhere, uh, the, the oral pills would be preferred. So is it okay if you switch to DOS instead of FLOT? Great question. So um, pre-COVID, I was very much for FLOT compared to DOS because I don't know if you have all given like DCX or DCF before, and it's not easy to give DCX and DCF before. So DOS is not very different from DCX or DCF. So along those lines, it is, a, I won't say a lot more toxic, but a little bit more toxic than FLOT. FLOT is something that we're actually quite comfortable giving. I regularly give my 75 year olds FLOT without much problems. But in the, in the COVID era, I agree with you, this issue of putting in, getting in a pot and the patient carrying the pump around and having to come back to hospital another time and all that has Sorry. gotten us to lean a little bit more towards DOS, but I will, urge you to select your patients very, very carefully if you're giving your DOS and have a very low threshold to switch it to FLOT if the patients start to develop toxicity. That's my um, practical well, advice. Somebody you know, who, who cannot come frequently to the hospital uh, yeah. uh, could be you know, uh, given DOS instead of uh, FLOT. Uh, and who are physically fit. I think the fitness yeah, is right, important. Right, right. I agree. I agree. FLOT I is something that you is much easier to give. I mean, like I'll be very scared to give a 75-year-old DOS. I'll be very clear with it. So. Sure. So a fit person was young and has yeah. uh, so so that option has become available now, which was not there before. I mean, let's put it this Absolutely. way. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Raghu, you want to ask a question? Yeah. When you when the patient cannot swallow the capsule, uh, what do you do? Can you open the capsule and put it via a right tube? Uh, for example, a esophageal cancer patient or a gastric outlet uh, uh, obstruction patient cannot swallow the capsule and it will be purposeless. So can you uh, open it and mix it with uh, some fruit juice and give it via a, uh, something like uh, fruit juice or uh, buttermilk or something? Or is that permitted? Or with water Next. for that? Or for simple water? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, good question. I think it's a practical question. But uh, generally speaking, these are uh, cytotoxic drugs. And we would prefer not to do stuff to the cytotoxic drugs. <laughs> that will end, uh, increase exposure to others and things like that. And I would urge the patients to seriously consider infusional five of you in these sort of situations. <laughs> but that being said, yes, we do have a lot of patients who are absolutely flat out refusing a port and a pump and those sort of things. And in those situations, um, you can uh, open the capsule and dissolve it. Um, generally, we'll get the pharma, pharma, our pharmacist to give some recommendations on what is the best um, sort of... Uh, diluent to put it into, to, to put it down an NG tube. But again, at least there, there has to be a discussion of switching the patient to infusional before we start doing these sort of things, you know, so. I have yeah. one more question. Why is it in hard gelatin capsule? 
do your vegetarian patients object to that uh, i don't have an answer to that question <laughs> <laughs> it came from japan and i don't think there are a lot of vegetarian patients in japan so but in singapore you must be having some vegetarians at least from south india no, from gujarat hard i don't think i don't think our patients have ever i don't i haven't had a single patient of mine who's asked me this question so i i have no answer to that <laughs> Okay, so okay. more of a pharmac pharmaco. I think uh, Raghu we will take it maybe <laughs> with a different. So Dr. Biswajit wants to understand the dose adjustments. Biswajit, uh, can you explain your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to know two, uh, three questions. One was that uh, if you have to reduce the dose, at what level would you want to reduce the dose? And uh, like we had in the EOX a schedule where we could give capsaicin at a very low dose on a continuous schedule, which seems to also be. Quite uh, easy to give, and compared to giving capox uh, when you give it fourteen uh, out of twenty-one days. So in the EOX, when the capsaicin was at six twenty-five, seems to be very easily given. Uh, given. So do you have data like that for the uh, S one drug? And uh, is there any interaction with food? If there, so can we uh, with the food could we reduce the dosage? So we need to adjust that. Yeah. So um, great questions. I am not aware of any. a big data on uh, continuous dosing i think the the usual discussions are just switching from four 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 weeks on two weeks off to two weeks on one week off sort of regimen in terms of dose adjustments i think it follows the same principles of dose adjustment as capsaicin does in terms of if you achieve a grade 2 intolerable toxicity or a grade 3 toxicity then you dose reduce by one dose level um generally broad principles reduce by 20 um a percent or so is a reasonable dose reduction and um in terms of food usually the recommendations we give for capsaicin are very similar to the recommendations that we give for s1 which is the strong sip inhibitors no staph fruit pomegranate um pomelo that sort of uh, stuff and um yeah good question on the continuous dosing i don't know but I I hardly use continuous metronomic cap in my practice, so I'm not sure if that's commonly performed in your uh, in your practice. But I hardly use it because most of my patients like a break from not taking the drug, so we're better off. I mean, it's, unless it's a very forgetful elderly patient sort of thing that's taking it on a daily basis, most of most of my patients like taking a break. You're possibly better off just reducing the dose and sticking to the two weeks on, one week off sort of thing. Yeah. okay uh, thank you so much uh, so dr raghav there is another question here regarding the dpd screening dr bharat parik wants to know do you do that uh, routinely for s1 <clears throat> we do it for 5 fu okay i beg your pardon do we do it for 5 fu okay like do we, do do we normally do a dpd screening for 5 fu okay like before you give the drug not really Yeah, so I think that's the same practice here. We don't do the. Re- I mean, of course, you give the drug. The patient has severe toxicity and suggests a DPD deficiency. Then we send off the screen. But even in Singapore, the screen is still sent off to the Mayo Clinic in the US, and it's expensive. So we don't. It's not that easy to test for DPD, at least in Singapore. I don't know how easy it is to test in India. But like pharmacogenomic selection of patients to treat this one is not a standard thing. And I would urge you to use the same sort of guidelines you use for K. Correct. Right. Absolutely. so i think the, the the questions are sort of drying up here so i mean if you were to uh, you know uh, uh, sort of uh, you know discuss this and uh, finalize this so where do you think the drug is going to go i mean uh, the metastatic gastric cancer or advanced gastric cancer certainly on uh, for uh, perioperative we did discuss so what about adjuvants in in the uh, stomach cancer so is it uh, routinely used or should it be uh, you know so what are your thoughts so so the the places where i use s1 most commonly is in adjuvant gastric actually because there okay. is a role for single agent s1 i also commonly use it in pancreatic cancer where patients don't want injections and only want tablets sort of thing that's the only tablet option for pancreatic cancer if you if you think about it right and the same story goes with biliary tract cancers as well it's the only tablet option for biliary tract cancer as well so i think uh, these are the strongest evidence those are uh, sorry to uh, interrupt so those are for the uh, metastatic setting pancreatic and biliary tract uh pancreatic is both actually adjuvant as well as metastatic 
but in pancreatic it's a gem cap uh, protocol you know uh, you you have the gem cap protocol for pancreas uh, yeah, so but okay, but single agent s1 there's no single agent cape side there's no role for single agent cape side to be you know, oh. adjuvant or metastatic setting in pancreatic cancer but there is a role for single agent s1 in both adjuvant and metastatic pancreatic cancer so if you want to use a tablet single agent drug then you're better off using s1 compared to cape side to be like i mean on a practical basis your question is when should i use s1 now that i have it rather than cape because we are potentially were using cape as an as a surrogate for s1 until it's available but now that s1 is available the strongest evidence for s1 where you should not be using cape and you should be using f1 s1 if where it's available the strongest evidence is in these sort of situations right so single agent adjuvant gastric single agent metastatic gastric single agent uh, metastatic pancreas single agent uh, adjuvant pancreas adjuvant biliary tract these are the five places that i think we will use it without questions and no one will ask you hey why did you not offer the patient cape in the rest of situations where you could use s1 or could use cape to me it comes down to a cost thing and at least in singapore s1 is still more expensive than cape both are pretty cheap but they're still s1 is still more expensive than cape so most of the time we practically will choose cape over s1 so uh, the rest of the rules the rule for s1 is a lot less compared to cape side to be so, what, what about colon colon i hardly use it in colorectal cancer okay so i think uh, i, I mean you can so i hardly use it there yeah so uh, i think was one question i don't think you can use um, s1 after the failure of cape cytobine um, because uh, it is just a similar you know conversion into 5fu uh, and as dr uh, raghav said it has a uh, you know what, what do you think about the dutch data where the incidence of hand foot syndrome was you know much uh, lower with s1 So I mean, so, so what do you think? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it is a randomized study, so it's there yes. for people to quote. But on a practical basis, I don't see a difference between the two. Okay, so that's where perhaps the pharmacodynamics may be coming into play when you look at Asian uh, patients and Asian uh, incidence. Um. So okay. So is there any biomarker in development? <clears throat> I mean, no one's no one's S- working. No one's no. working on this. No one's moved to Lonsaf for any work. At least I was focusing mostly on Lonsaf, and even Lonsaf is coming off patent soon. So I don't think there's any major uh, basic research that's being done in the S one space at the moment. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we we um, the questions in the chat box are uh, sort of uh, finished here. I mean, I do have a long set of slides which I can uh, continue to show. uh purvesh what do you think i mean do you want to continue this or um, since we are little ahead of time here um i think we can uh, show the next slide uh, kashish yeah so so i think these are the issues uh, uh, which you know uh, could be um, important when you are looking at new uh, fluoropyrimidines uh, i think um, dr raghav has very clearly said uh the differences between s1 and cape cytobine are there in terms of efficacy as a single agent especially for pancreatic tumors and biliary tract tumors uh although he feels uh there's another question in the chat box regarding cardiac uh, toxicity to cape cytobine so so what about s1 it has the same because it gets converted into 5fu in the in the, in the body yeah so so we we've had a lot of chats on this and in fact a lot of us although there's no head to head comparisons and things like that a lot of us feel that the cardio tox of cape actually may potentially be more than say for example bolus 5 fu or infusion 5 fu so if your patient actually suffers a cardiac tox because of cape side been uh, especially if you're talking about specifically like a 5 fu induced cardiac tox like uh, yeah. coronary artery vasospasm yeah. 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 then then you are potentially better off switching the patient to an infusion 5 if you are even like the older roswell park mayo sort of bolus 5 if you sort of regimens compared to um say switching i mean although the ema recommendation is to consider switching from cape to s1 personally i'll be quite afraid of giving a patient s1 after giving cape and the patient gets a vasospasm to then give them s1 i'll actually be quite afraid of it 
I don't know. I mean, um, we, we used to give raltitrexid to some of our patients with DPT deficiencies in the past, but I don't know if that's still available. They stopped selling it in Singapore, actually. So, yeah, I, I haven't seen it um, ever, you know, I mean, uh, raltitrexid. Um, so I think, uh, so what you're saying is that we should switch to 5-FU infusion or yeah. bolus? Yeah. If, if somebody general, is... Talks from CAPE, I would switch to infusion of 5 fu I would not use S1 as an alternative to CAPE for TOX. That's the bottom line, I think. So, Right. So so I think those are the issues uh, when it comes to S1 uh, because it has uh, edge in terms of uh, efficacy as was shown earlier in several of those studies. Uh, the side effect profile, although there are differences, uh, of course, ease of administration is there. Uh, is Dr. Shekhar Patil there? Because I haven't heard uh, from him in the in the panel. Yeah, Shekhar, uh, I can see you um, uh, as as a panelist, but uh, I haven't. Uh, I mean, if you have any question or any comment, please uh, feel free to uh, you know uh, button. I uh, can I have the next slide in the meantime. I think those were some practical points, as I said, um, which is you know what has led to the. Um, emergence of these oral uh, pro drugs like capecitabine and now we have s1 uh, next slide sorry i'm curious when you said when you put up cost uh, just just for my in understanding what kind right of so, had for yeah, s1, so like, go to the previous compared, slide please like, compared to cape and s1 what sort of and uh, say for example a cycle of degromont or something like that what sort of so if you have to do the infusional 5fu then you have to go for chemo ports and the pick lines mm -hmm. etc so which does add to the cost and then the patient has to uh, sort of uh, be near you or near the hospital uh, for you know removal of the needle, et cetera. And that does add to the cost as compared to Cape Cytobine. So I have no idea here in India as to what the cost of S1 is really going to be because this drug is just, uh, you know, uh, has, has not been launched. So I have no idea of the cost at all. So, so I mean, what I'm getting from you is that S1 is much more expensive than Cape Cytobine. Like it's at least like I think in Singapore, like CAPE is like one dollar per day or something like that, but S1 is like five dollars per day or something, five, about five times more expensive. So, right. So, yeah. we, I mean, I mean CAPE cytobine is just uh, very, very cheap here. Um, um, I don't know the cost of S1, but it certainly is uh, much lower than infusional 5FU because of the logistics, hospitalization, etc., because that adds to the cost of the treatment, you know. So the patient has to bear the cost of hospitalization, port, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think the question between infusional and tablet, I don't think that that one is, a, there are lots of things apart from cost, but I was more curious about the differential in cost between um, the, the S1 drug. and K. Yeah, because I think that will come into play when you're offering your patient. One drug is clearly cheaper than the other. Yeah. Right, so we are not aware of the cost at this point in time, time because the drug has not been uh, made available to us. So this is the first kind of uh, session on S1 which we are going through. So can we have the next slide? So issues with Cape Cytobine. So, you know, because of, the, I mean, that's another issue. Raghu, are you there? There, Dr. Raghu. Very much yeah, there, you know, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I just wanted to um, ask uh, to the panelists, what percentage of patients go through the toxicity necessitating dose reductions? And, the, and then, of course, the efficacy does tend to get compromised. So I think that's a very important question uh, with Cape Cytobine in, 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 in all over the world, I think, and in India as well. Typically, we don't see that when we use infusional 5-FU. Right. Uh, you see that more often with uh, uh, oral Cape Cytobine because the various... Uh, Medical oncologists use various doses, uh, yes. starting from 750 milligrams per square meter twice daily, which is supposed to be the standard dose. Most patients can't tolerate that. Uh, so they drop down, for example, radiation oncologists when they are irradiating the rectum. Uh, they use a dose of uh, 850 milligrams per square meter once a day. So um, mm. that's the standard dose they use. But typically, yes, you find that uh, there is a dose compromise Whenever you use any oral drug, there is a dose compromise. So one way of looking at it is patients uh, tend to drop a pill here and there. So that is a possibility with any oral drug. It can be capecitabine, it can be S1 as well. Whereas they can't do that when you're giving an infusional uh, uh, 5-FU. That's, you, you have given it and you can't uh, possibly get out of it. Nothing more than that. 
So that that is always there. So right. dose reduction can happen at your level. It can happen at the patient's level with uh, a little bit of GI disturbance as they swallow the pill. Yeah. Dr. Prabhat, you want to add something to uh, this issue? On this issue? Uh, nothing, sir. What uh, Dr. Raghu has said is uh, something similar that we face. We are we tend to reduce the dose of capsitabin very early, and five p once it is gone, it is gone. I see another question here, Dr. Raghav, regarding bioavailability of S one after gastrectomy. Yeah, great question. I think um, if you just go back to the older studies like AXGC, all the patients had gastrectomy and then had S one and had overall survival benefit. We know that it's going in and doing something. So just based on that, I would say that uh, it probably doesn't have a major effect. Uh, they have, I, I can't remember the S1 studies, but I have seen like the, the newer trials, like with the other Taiho drugs, like Lonserf and things like that, where they've looked at the bioavailability of their drugs after gastrectomy, and it's been pretty good. So I don't think there's a major problem with bioavailability for, from the gastrectomy point of view. But yeah, so it's, it's a very practical question. So, I mean, my only concern is the gelatin capsule is supposed to typically dissolve in the stomach and then release the drug. Am I right? Or you expect it to dissolve beyond the, uh, I mean, the C loop and then get into the jejunum for it to dissolve? Typically, studies are done with the gastric juice for its dissolution. So, the question is if there is no gastric juice with some compromise in the uh, surgical compromise, or let us say you. The patient had a, a gastrojejunostomy as a, a palliative procedure. When they open up to do a laparotomy and a, a debulking, they fail, and then they do a palliative anterior GJ. Would that affect the absorption of S1? Uh, that is quite possible. That's what yeah, I guess. Absolutely. So I don't, I, S1 I don't is absorbed from the stomach. Yeah, so I don't disagree with you that the absorption be Yeah, I don't disagree that the absorption may be affected. But all I can say is that for, for sure, we know from like studies like AXGC where you're compared it with doing nothing that the drug is going in and doing something, right? So it's definitely being absorbed um, after a gastrectomy. Whether the patients without a gastrectomy are absorbing it better than the patients with a gastrectomy um, from, again, the subgroup analysis from a lot of these studies, there isn't a lot of difference in the, in the survival and those sort of things when you compare these sort of when you do these sort of comparisons, so like if you look at the if you look at most of your gastric cancer studies uh, with S1, if you look at the subgroup between gastrectomy and no gastrectomy, there isn't much differences in efficacy. So at least if you and most of us care about the efficacy endpoint at the end of the day, right? So if the efficacy endpoint is not altered by the gastrectomy, then that itself is your clear answer that the I mean from a from a very uh, uh, pedantic point of view, I agree with you that maybe it's affected, but if the efficacy is not affected, then I'm not quite sure that we should, at least on a practical basis, when we're making these decisions of whether to give the drug or not, whether the, gas, the presence or absence of gastrectomy should make us decide for whether to give a, a S1 or not, essentially. So we can actually do away with the soft gelatin, hard gelatin shell. That's what my point is. If that's nothing to do with the dissolution, the absorption, and finally the efficacy, I don't see any reason why it should be in a hard gelatin shell? That one, I am not sure, and I probably can't come. I would strongly, actually, the I'm not sure if you're getting, are you getting S1 from Taiho directly, or are you going to get it through a parallel importer or something like that? Or you're not sure of this? We are not sure. So we, we are not because, sure. Uh, sure, because because Taiho is generally quite um, approachable when it comes to this sort of stuff. At least in Singapore, like the Taiho reps always are there for us to ask these questions and they'll get a proper pharmacist to answer these questions for you when you ask them. So I'll actually urge you to, uh, especially I, I, I understand your concerns about the gelatin capsule sort of thing. I'll actually urge you to reach out to your, the, the Taiho guys to help you address this. Considering that India is a pretty big market, they will probably consider, I mean, again, I'm not sure if you're getting it directly from Taiho or not, but if you are, then you should talk to them because they are pretty approachable and they will probably help address this in a in a more scientific way, scientific slash pharmacology driven way than I am answering from a clinician's sort of perspective for this. So, yeah. so uh, can I can have a next slide. So I think uh, we we're coming to the towards the end. So I think just um, 
Can, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, next. So I think this, I think Dr. Raghav had already shown the composition and mechanism of action. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate, next slide. Next, next, next. I just wanted to show the S1. Next slide, please. I think those are the all the basic stuff. Next. You know, so those are the drugs which are now available. Um, next slide. Next, please. Right, so I think this is what I wanted to show. So this is an oral anti-cancer drug that combines Tegafo uh, with a CDHP and potassium oxonate in this particular uh, molar ratio. One uh, is 2.4 is to one. And CDHP reversibly antagonizes the activity of EPD as was shown by Dr. Raghav. And potassium oxonate blocks the phosphorylation of IVFU in the GIT. And the side effects of uh, GI are, are sort of uh, much lower. So this question I wanted to ask to Dr. Raghav, that if somebody is having GI toxicity with Cape Cytobine, can we switch to S1? You mean like having diarrhea sort of thing? Right, diarrhea, yes. Yeah, yeah so... I mean, di diarrhea is definitely a much more common GI toxicity as compared to, say, uh, mucositis or uh, vomiting. We hardly see vomiting. Um, again, I will ask why we are not considering switching to infusion of 5-FU as compared to switching to S1. I think that it always goes back to this. So although Taihook always says that it's slightly less toxic, from a practical basis, it's always why are we not just switching it to infusional? And, and or if the patient insists on staying to staying with tablets, is have you considered just dose reducing the capsidabine and really challenging as compared to, uh, you are very likely to end up with very similar toxicities with S1 compared to capsidabine sort of thing. I mean, say for example, you give full dose cape and then the patient comes in with grade three diarrhea, diarrhea 10 times. Are you really willing to switch that patient to full dose S1? I'm not sure. You're not sure. Right? Okay. That's so your question. Yeah. Like, are you willing to switch to full dose S1? If you're saying you're going to switch to a lower dose S1, then you might as well try a low dose cape first rather than a lower dose I S1. I will get the answer that you are more keen on uh, 5-FU infusion rather than uh, switching from cape cetabine to S1. That's what I think you're clear. I mean, I think that you, at least if the patient's facing toxicities, that you should tell yes. the patient that there is a less toxic option and okay. then go back to your practical aspects of pump and all those things. I mean, we, have, we, all, we all face those issues, but it shouldn't just be a direct... Oh, you're having a problem. This take another tablet is going to cause you less toxicities. I think that's not the correct answer, basically. Okay, great. So I think uh, we are ahead of time now. Um, I mean, I think we are past our time. So before I close, now that all of us have heard the data uh, on the efficacy, toxicity, dosing, etc., of S1, so I like each of our experts to state their views uh, as to where they would like to incorporate this drug. And I'll start with Bhavesh first. So, Bhavesh, you think there is a scope for S1 in your practice? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I feel that especially in gastric cancer and pancreatic cancer, uh, I have little bit still data or have doubt about the adjuvant and that is for the duration, like six months or one year. Uh, so, at present, I am considering uh, S1 in uh, metastatic gastric cancer as well as pancreatic cancer. Okay, so two indications. Dr. Prabhat, where do you think you will be using S1 uh, once it gets launched in, in the day-to-day in the -day practice? Uh, sir, I would like to give an adjuvant setting for stomach uh, after perioperative uh, setting because I feel uh, giving just four months of therapy with perioperative uh, plot is somewhere inadequate and giving something for more six months may make sense as we have data from stomach. Uh, from breast cancer and other therapies. So there and pancreatic cancer, obviously, uh, oral therapy, is, this is one of the good options as an oral therapy. Okay, so adjuvant pancreatic and in uh, gastric cancer. Dr. Biswajit? Uh, I think uh, beautifully summarized by Dr. Raghav, I think I'll use only in place where single agent capecitabine has to be given. In that situation, I will use, otherwise, I'll. I think the toxicities and everything, it's going to be similar. So okay. wherever single agent capecitabine is there, I, we could use S1. Okay. And uh, our surgical oncologist, if he's still there, Dr. Sridhar? 
So, uh, yeah, sir, I am there. <laughs> yeah. so, so, what do you yeah. think? I mean, should we uh, use DOS? Uh, are you going to be happy with that? Yeah, I think uh, perioperative, I mean, uh, probably DOS, our people are more in favor nowadays of DOS. Yeah, uh, could... any T3, T4 node, uh, for some form of gastrectomy, they're going for the flot. Uh, maybe, uh, I think, but for Sir said, we do get a lot of uh, pancreatic cancers, which are the metastatic. Yeah. Uh, sometimes patients have got affordability issues or you know, performance status issues. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Raghu, your comments. Uh, I, I will start with the uh, metastatic gastric cancer. Uh, just yeah. uh, slowly move up to the locally advanced and, and possibly then to the adjuvant. That would be my chance. Those settings, those settings probably. Right. I think uh, so. We heard everyone's view. So we have a new drug uh, on the horizon for us, although it's a 5FU pro drug. Uh, with toxicities, as uh, Dr. Raghav has told, which are quite similar uh, to Cape Cytobine, uh, but the efficacy uh, points are definitely uh, different. So we can't really treat this as uh, a substitute for Cape Cytobine, to my mind. Uh, I think uh, there'll be niche indications for S1. And I think as we uh, you know, uh, get the handle of the drug in our day-to-day -day practice, so we're going to be uh, you know, uh, using the drug more and more often. So with this, I thank uh, all the experts on the panel and particularly Dr. Raghav staying uh, back so very late. You know, it's a weekend, I know, but then <laughs> thank you very much for, uh, for uh, staying back and helping us out, uh, learning about 5FU pro drug. Uh, the, the nuances, you know, which, you, which you, we can only learn from a clinician. So thank you and over to the organizers. Thank you very much, Dr. Sham. Thank you very much for the, all the panelists. This was really exciting. And we will uh, see how best to apply it in the Indian context. And uh, now we go for the expert conclusion by none other than Dr. Satya Dattatre, senior medical oncologist from Hyderabad, and also a dear friend. So over to you, Satya. Uh, Satya, sir, can I request you to unmute your mic, sir? Satya, we can't hear you. That seems to be uh, some issue with Dr. Satya. Let me just try and call him. something so what is your yeah so so on behalf of uh, the entire torrent pharma i take this opportunity to express a sincere gratitude to all the respected doctors who, who have attended this program your expertise and suggestions will certainly help us in our new endeavor uh, the valuable inputs and views uh, shared by you during this virtual ISP will definitely help us to chart our uh, future courses of action and thereby strengthen our position in the oncology segment. We express our sincere gratitude to the speaker, Dr. Raghav Sundar from the National University of Cancer Institute of Singapore and all our respected chairpersons and panelists from India. Uh, the oral format and flow of this meeting will not have been really as meaningful had it not been guided by you. We are really thankful to each one of you for making today's program successful. And I also extend my thanks to Kashish and his team of Kavina Creations for organizing it so well. I once again thank all of you and believe that your support for Torrent will remain in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you very much.